I am so delighted that we get to witness a baptism here today. It's been so long since we've had one here. Obviously, because of COVID and the restrictions, we've had to keep safe so that um, there won't be any spread of that. But today, we get to witness Tim Mills being baptized by a family member, Cobus Bench. And yeah, we get to celebrate that. Now, baptism is not your actual um, getting saved. It's not that. It's not because that's really about you giving your life to Jesus and accepting him and confessing sin and having him wash that away. But what it really is, it's an outward declaration, demonstration, and celebration of what Jesus has already done. And that's what we'll be celebrating today here with Tim. So total immersion is one actually being dipped completely in water as a symbol of what Jesus has done by dying with Jesus, having him take away and wash away all our sins, and rising to a new life. Yeah, it's that outward declaration of him actually having caused an experience of change in our lives. Now, I want to purchase this with Romans 6 verse 4, and it says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So what we'll do now is I'm going to hand over to Kobus and Tim so that Tim can be baptized right about now, and you'll get to hear his story. Hi, uh, my name's Tim Mills. Um, I'm a yard supervisor in um, a tyre recycling centre. I have a daughter, a 10-year-old daughter, uh, my wife, at home. From a very young age, I've struggled with life um, to a degree uh, you know, it's, it's pretty unexplainable, to be fair. I, I had lots of issues growing up as a child, very angry at life, very angry at the world, a um, bit of a bad upbringing, you could say. Um, it got to a point in my life where I'd be walking around the common near where I lived, um, and I'd be looking at tree branches to see which would be the best one to hold my weight. Um, and suicide became a very solid option for me, um, to the point that it was very last minute that I pulled out. As I say, I came to Kerif to attend the wedding of Katrina and Corbus. Um, Corbus is my father-in-law. Um, and I felt something in the church building that I couldn't explain. I, I couldn't explain at the time. I didn't know what it was. I just felt that something felt really, really good. And I felt really, really good. And uh, I, I wanted to explore it a bit further. Um, reluctantly came back to Kerif for a Sunday service. Um, it was originally to get my daughter in to see how she dealt with the Kerif youth. Um, and Corpus brought us into the main church and we sat and through the service, all I remember feeling was just power, absolute power, and I didn't know what it was, but it was amazing. Decided to take my dog for a walk onto the common, the very same common that I'd sized trees up for my demise. And uh, it was a stormy night, very stormy and uh, very windy, had a bit of trouble keeping my balance and uh, I thought, well, you know, in, in my mind, this is this is what my mind feels like in, in my head. This is a good description of my mind. My mind is a storm, and it's constantly racing at 100 miles an hour, 200 miles an hour. And for me, it was a good depiction. And I, I thought, now's the time. If I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray. I'm going to go big or go home. And uh, I said out loud, no, no one else was around. It was dark, windy, raining. I said, uh, God, if you're there, and you can hear me, please calm the storm that is my mind so that I can think clearly for once in my life because it's all I've ever wanted to do. And I woke up the very next morning and instantly I felt different. And I mean instantly, so the, the second I woke up I felt completely different. Um, I felt at peace, I felt, you know, I wasn't 110 mile an hour in my mind, I wasn't thinking 101 things in 30 seconds, uh, I wasn't didn't feel angry, didn't feel sour about anything, felt very calm, very relaxed. 
I can honestly say, hand on heart, the storm hasn't returned. The reason I'm gonna, I want to get baptised is uh, it's in public obedience, uh, but public display of obedience, sorry. Um, and it's my next leap of faith. I've, I've followed the faith to a, de to a point where I want to take that next step and publicly declare Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. <laughs> Wasn't that an amazing testimony from Tim? Probably you'd like to get baptized too. So when we begin to meet normally, what you could do is head over to our website. And if you go to the specific page for your site, what you'll do is scroll down and you'll find a link to baptisms. And there you can find out all the things that you need to know so that you can be baptized too. And perhaps you'd like to go on this journey of discovering more about who Jesus is. I'd like to recommend that you look on our webpage as well and find out about the next Alpha course that we'll be running. So right now, I'd like to hand back over to Simon. Hey, well, happy Easter, everyone. Wonderful to be with you. I just want to declare, as we've already heard this morning, he is risen. And uh, wasn't that amazing to hear Tim's story to watch him get baptized. Someone was just saying that Tim's on the YouTube chat. So Tim, if you're there, it's great to have you with us this morning. It's great to see your baptism. It's great to hear your story. Why don't you show Tim some love in the chat and uh, just how exciting it is to hear his story. Because in many ways, his story is a metaphor for what we're celebrating today. He spoke about how he went from literally death planning his own death to life, to finding Jesus. And that was only possible because of Jesus. And uh, it's wonderful to see a baptism that was recorded on Wednesday this week. Um, Tim came here into the Kerith Center and we filmed that. And I personally wasn't able to be here. I was somewhere else. Um, and it makes me realize what we're missing at the moment. I guess like you. There's so much stuff that we've been missing. This is our second Easter in lockdown. I did see this little graphic this week that made me laugh. Um, lockdown never really worked around Easter. Um, that was certainly the message of that first Easter. There was no way you could lock down Jesus. There was no way you could keep him enclosed. There was no way that you could keep him in that grave. He burst out full of life. But as we've entered this second Easter in lockdown, it's just made me reflect on all the things that we've been missing and that I've been missing and I'm sure you've been missing as well. And they're all things physical. Hey, we've had the wonder of technology that's allowed us to connect on the internet and Zoom and WhatsApp and you know, all those different means that we've been able to keep in touch with people. But we've so missed the physical, haven't you? Haven't you missed physically connecting with people? I guess like me, you've had that experience. I've been out for walks and you suddenly meet somebody face to face. Maybe you've seen them on a screen. Maybe you've chatted to them on a, a breakout room. But suddenly you see that person face to face. And that face to face different is totally experience is totally different to seeing that person two dimensionally on a screen. It's so much more real. It's so much more alive. There's something visceral about that moment. And I think it's all been physical stuff that we've missed in this season. I just can't wait to see the sea again. All you lucky folks on West White, I'm very jealous because I feel like it's so long since I've seen the sea, heard the sound, smelt it, just been in that experience. I long to see a mountain again. You know, Bracknell, we have a few slopes, but I long to see the majesty of a mountain. I want to see those couples who got married in lockdown and be able to stand with them and hug with them and celebrate them. You know, all those kids who've been born in lockdown, many of whom are now like toddling around, and you think, well, we haven't physically seen them. I, I long to be back in those settings again. Hey, so many of us have just missed seeing people physically, friends, siblings, parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren. We long for that physical connection. Hey, to come here to church again on a Sunday and hug one another, shake hands with one another, embrace one another, to worship together. Don't you long for that, to be in a room again, 
with other believers as we just lift up the name of Jesus. Hey, I'm really looking forward to being in sporting events again, being able to go to a football match again, to go to the theatre, to see a play, to go to the cinema and see a film, to see and experience live music again. We've so missed the physical. We've so missed touch. We've so missed seeing one another. We've so missed hearing one another. And as we reflected on that, I, I've been struck again about the physicality of Jesus and the physicality of the resurrection. Hey, the message of Christianity is that God dwelt among us. Not just as an idea, not just as a concept, but in human flesh. He physically walked among us. Of all the disciples, John, one of the followers of Jesus who wrote an account of the life of Jesus, he wrote several letters in the Bible. He also wrote the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. He seems to have had this incredibly physical relationship with Jesus. In one of his letters, 1 John, I love what he writes at the very beginning. He says, that which was from the beginning. He's talking about Jesus. If you know his gospel, he begins the same way. In the beginning was the word, was Jesus. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. John's saying, hey, I heard Jesus. I heard him speak. I heard him teach. I heard him interact with people, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at. Hey, John has not only heard Jesus, but he's seen Jesus. He's watched Jesus. He's observed Jesus. But he goes even further and he says this, which we have and which our hands have touched. Hey, John has not only heard Jesus and seen Jesus, he's held Jesus. He has touched Jesus. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. And the message of Christianity is that God in Jesus came to live with us. You know, Buddhism has Buddha the teacher who came to teach people about God. Islam has Muhammad the prophet who similarly came to teach about God. They were people who claimed to have heard the divine word. Jesus claimed to be the divine word. He was God with us. And John again and again in his gospel, his account of the life of Jesus, talks about people touching Jesus, holding Jesus, and Jesus touching others. He accentuates again and again the, the reality, the physicality of Jesus. And we particularly see that in his accounts of the resurrection. The first person to see the resurrected Jesus is Mary Magdalene. And what does Mary do when she sees Jesus? She goes and grabs hold of him. To the extent that after a while, Jesus has to say, hey, let me go. I've got other stuff that I need to do. But she just wants to grab him. She can't believe that he's alive again. Maybe she's fearful that he's going to go again. She's watched him die. She thought that was the end, but suddenly he's there physically before her. John similarly records that with the disciples, Jesus turns up in a room. Hey, he's got a physical resurrected body. It's, it's not the same as his body was before. It seems to be able to pass through walls and people don't always recognize him. But Jesus appears to the disciples in a room. On another occasion, he's by a lakeside and he physically hands them bread and fish. He's made breakfast for them all. But perhaps in the most touching account of the risen Jesus, we read of somebody called Thomas. And Thomas is sometimes called Doubting Thomas. I'm not sure that's fair. I think Thomas was a strong character. We read earlier in John's Gospel that Thomas is the one who says, Jesus, I'll die with you. And when, when Jesus appeared to all the disciples, they were hiding in a room. They'd locked the door because they were so scared. The only person who wasn't in that room, the only disciple not in that room was Thomas. 
I wonder actually whether Thomas was braver than the other disciples. He wasn't so scared. He was willing to be out of that space. But for whatever reason, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus first appeared to the other disciples. And we read this, Thomas, called Didymus, that means twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But that's not enough for Thomas. He said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, I want to see this risen Jesus. But he wants to do more than see. Unless I put my fingers where the nails were. He wants to prove to himself that Jesus isn't some apparition, isn't a ghost, but is real, is physical. Unless I see the nail marks, and unless I put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side. I remember as Jesus was on the cross, a Roman soldier pierced his side. Blood and water flowed out. Thomas says, unless I put my hand in his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them this time. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas makes this amazing confession of faith. My Lord and my God. Up to this point is the clearest confession of faith that anybody has made. He confesses Jesus as God. Not a God, the God. And he confesses Jesus as my Lord. Hey Jesus, you're my Lord. You're the one in control of my life. You're the one I give my life to. I hand my life over to you. And Jesus, I confess that you are not just a teacher or a prophet. You are God, you are God in human flesh. God who died for us and God who has now risen from the dead for us. And then Jesus, I think, spoke to all of us because we might be there saying, well, I'd like to see Jesus too. I'd like to touch Jesus too. Hey, how am I supposed to believe unless I can see him and touch him? And Jesus told Thomas, because you've seen, you've believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And I guess as we enter into this Easter day, we're in two different camps. Hey, some of us have believed in Jesus and some of us haven't yet believed in Jesus. Theologians actually are not sure which sense Jesus says that in. When he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, is the blessing on those who choose to believe for the first time or those who go on continuing to believe. And most theologians reckon that it's both. That Jesus is speaking to both groups today. And I want to speak to you today on this Easter Sunday. I want to declare to you that he has risen and he is risen. That Jesus physically rose from the dead. And when Jesus died on the cross, what we demonstrated there, what he showed there, what he revealed there was the love of God. If you ever doubt that God loves you, just look at the cross. If you ever wonder, hey, is God interested in me. Look at the cross. Heard it said before that it wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was his love for me and it was his love for you. I want you to know today that you are loved by God. Jesus said this greater love has no one than that they lay down their lives for their friends. And God wants you to be his friend. And on the cross, he demonstrated his love for us. Wonderful. 
But if the cross demonstrates the love of God, if the cross shows God as a God of love, the resurrection shows God as the God of life. Hey, God doesn't just want to love you. He wants to give life to you. And because of the resurrection, we can know the life that is available in God through knowing God. John goes on after talking about believing. He says this, these things that he's written down are written so that you may believe. John realized there were a whole load of us who were never going to physically see Jesus, who were never going to physically touch Jesus. So he wrote his gospel. He wrote his account of the life of Jesus. Why? So that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And what that by believing you may have life in his name. And I believe God today wants to speak life over every one of us. The life that comes from knowing the risen Jesus. The first measure of that life is life for eternity. Hey, by believing in Jesus, you can know eternal life. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. And God wants to give each one of us eternal life. God wants to take away our sin. That's what Jesus did on the cross. And God wants to replace it with his life in each one of us. And that is a life for eternity. There's a day when Jesus is going to come back again. And he is not going to take us to heaven to be disembodied spirits floating around on clouds playing harps. What he's going to do on that day is he's going to initiate a new heaven and a new earth. Heaven and earth are going to come together. And it's going to be the most physical place ever. We will be able to touch him. We will be able to hold him. And the promise of life for every one of us is new life, eternal life. Life everlasting. Hey, we should be people who long for that day when Jesus comes again. Because when that day comes, there will no longer be any tears or any sadness or any suffering or any sorrow. Why? Because we know eternal life in him. Life as it was always meant to be. Life in God. But the promise of God is not just eternal life once we've died. Hey, because of that, death has lost its sting. We no longer fear death. But the promise of God is not only that life in eternity, but life right here, right now. And how do we access that life? By believing in the risen Jesus. I love that transformation that Tim has experienced in his life. He talked about the turmoil in his mind. He talked about just the, the wind and the storm being a metaphor for what was going on in him. But what happened, he believed in Jesus and everything changed. It's not that life doesn't still have challenges, that life still doesn't have things that he's struggling with, but because Jesus rose from the dead, he's now experiencing a whole new life in Jesus. Hey, for those of you who've never believed, I want to say that what Jesus spoke over you is possible. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And there may be some right now, maybe you heard Tim's story and went, well, that's me. Maybe you need to pray that prayer that Tim prayed. Hey, God, come into my life. Maybe you want to ask God right now to come into your life. Hey, we've got some folks who would love to pray with you right now. If you go onto our church website, kevith.church slash live, and press the button for live prayer, there's someone from our community who would love to pray with you right now. Right now, you can pray a prayer of commitment. You can come to know Jesus. You can believe and but by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen? But some of you may not yet be at that point. You might go, well, I've still got some doubts. Well, I want to encourage you to explore those doubts. 
That's what I did when I became a follower of Jesus. I grew up in a non-Christian home. And when I was 18, um, I got invited to church and I began to investigate the claims of Jesus. And particularly begin to investigate this claim that he is risen, that he is raised from the dead. And I found there's compelling evidence that you can believe, not just as a, 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 just a, like a vague hope, but have confidence. Yeah, he really was raised from the dead. He really was resurrected. And we run a brilliant course that examines that very question. It's called Alpha. And if you've got da- doubts, I want to encourage you, do Alpha. You've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. You might do that course and at the end of it conclude, well, this is just a bunch of nonsense. Well, that's okay. At least you've taken the time to look. But I think most people have never even considered the possibility that Jesus might actually be who he said he was. And he might actually really have risen from the dead. And I want to encourage you, give yourself the opportunity to believe. Explore him, examine him. You won't regret it. And then I want to speak to all of us who are followers of Jesus. I want to remind us that the same power that conquered the grave now lives in us. And we now have this incredible life in Jesus. And my encouragement this Easter Sunday is let's live it. Let's live it to the full. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I came that you might have life and life in all its abundance. And I want us to live our lives in the light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was with a friend yesterday, a dear friend who this week had a cancer diagnosis. Now faces what seems like an uncertain future. You know, what's going to happen next? How's it going to work out? I want to say that, that for her, everything is changed by the resurrection. Why? Because the resurrection brings life. And we're going to pray for healing. We're going to pray for breakthrough. We're going to pray for God to move. Whether he does that supernaturally, whether he does it through the doctors, but he is the God who brings life. And I want to encourage you to see the whole of your life through the lens of Jesus, the resurrected son. That your hope, your confidence, your trust is in him. That your eyes are fixed on him, not on anything else, not on every, any other external circumstance. Because he was raised from the dead, we can know this life. The life that God has for us. And ultimately, death has lost its sting. Why? Because our eternity is secure in him. So for those who've never believed... I want to encourage you today to believe, to know the blessing of knowing Jesus, to know the life of God. And for those of us who have believed, let's live our lives for Jesus. Hey, we now find a new purpose and meaning in our world. What is that? It's to show the world Jesus. Jesus is no longer physically present in our world, but we are with the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. And let's show the world Jesus. Let's be Jesus to the people in our families, to the people in our streets, to the people in our workplaces, to the people we interact with every day. Let's be ambassadors for Jesus. Let's demonstrate Jesus through the ways that we live, through the ways that we speak, through the words, through our actions, through all that we do. Hey, that we can now be the way that people touch Jesus and see Jesus and hear Jesus. And we will never get it perfect But God can come and work through us and move in us. And we can see many people go on that journey that Tim went on. I had no idea. I I took Katrina and Cobus' wedding. I remember Tim and his family walking in, sitting at the back. I had no idea what God was about to do in that moment, how God was about to begin to change a life. God is in the business of changing lives. He's changed my life. He's changed many of our lives and he wants to change many more lives. What Through what? Through this message that he is risen and the life that comes through him. So we're going to listen to an absolutely brilliant song now. And it's been great to worship today. I just love the energy that the band have brought and just watching that band worshiping together. And uh, we see this, read these words. He picked me up 
He turned me round. He placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master. I thank the saviour. Because he healed my heart. He changed my name. Forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master. I thank the saviour. I thank God. And if he did it for me, he can do it for you. Hey, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And because of that, we can know the incredible life of God. So let's worship him.